In this video, I want to say thanks for the supportive comments and also the interesting questions that people have been posing. And so we're going to cover some of those great questions right now. First, we have a set of questions about hiatal hernias and what makes them worse. One person was having great control of their hiatal hernia symptoms on a minimal dose of a PPI, but then they had really severe symptoms after a bad bout of food poisoning and a lot of vomiting. Another person wants to know if they can do sit-ups while they're having a hiatal hernia, and in the same theme, can they lift weights? These comments and questions get to the point that increasing the abdominal pressure can worsen a hiatal hernia. Really severe vomiting can do this, sit-ups could do this, and really heavy weightlifting could also do this. Now, it's difficult to quantify how much would it take to really make the symptoms worse, and it's important to note that most people with a hiatal hernia actually have a very small hiatal hernia, one that is probably actually not causing them much symptoms at all. And so for the vast majority of people, they really shouldn't anticipate much of anything about their lifestyle when they learn that they have a hiatal hernia. In fact, I want to make sure that you are exercising because weight loss that's supported through exercise and restriction of calorie intake is going to be one of the best things that you personally can do to improve your hiatal hernia. One study looked at people who had had a successful hiatal hernia repair only to later have it fail, and reasons that were found were because of vomiting and heavy weightlifting. Of interest, hiccups were not found to be a reason for failure of a hiatal hernia repair. There have also been case reports of young men who do very heavy powerlifting developing very large hiatal hernias. Large hiatal hernias are typically found in older patients, and so it's unusual to see someone so young have such a large hiatal hernia, and it's reasonable to extrapolate that the reason was their power lifting. It's important to emphasize there's a big difference between casually lifting weights, somewhere in the order of maybe 20, 30 pounds, and doing that in a controlled fashion, versus lifting hundreds of pounds with a power snap technique. So to conclude, I may not be able to give you a specific number, but I think as long as you're doing things in a controlled fashion and a reasonable weight and that you otherwise feel comfortable doing the exercise, then this shouldn't cause too much problem. We've had several videos about the difficulty of swallowing and how a GI doctor can fix this. One person commented about the expensive price of the procedure to dilate. They also had problems with their vocal cords being damaged. And finally, they were wondering where they could be taught how to do the self-dilation technique that was featured in a video. First off, I am sorry that you paid $5,000 for this procedure. It is worth shopping around because you will often find that if you are healthy enough to have the procedure performed in an outpatient endoscopy center, you are going to save a substantial amount of money compared to that price tag. Next, while it is a possibility that the vocal cords could be damaged during the procedure, that is quite uncommon. One case series that studied when people's vocal cords were damaged found that it is most typically occurring when a bougie technique in which a dilator is placed blindly through the mouth down into the esophagus is going to be when the vocal cords get damaged. And that is the same technique that a person is taught to use if they're dilating at home. Other techniques involve use of a guide wire or passing an instrument through the scope to dilate a balloon in the esophagus. I personally use all three techniques and I've not had this specific complication and I hope that I never will. As for finding a place that will teach you self-dilation, unless you live near the Mayo Clinic or the Cleveland Clinic, you probably won't too soon find one because this is a technique that is restricted to major academic centers. We've had a couple of videos talking about ascites, the accumulation of fluid in the abdomen and how that occurs and how to control it. And one viewer asked if you might be able to control this by sitting in a sauna. Now I think that this sounds like a very reasonable idea. Can't you just sweat it out? And I would say that yes, you probably could, but it would be dangerous to do so. And the reason is, is that sitting in a hot sauna when you have a problem with fluid retention means that your kidneys and your liver are probably not going to be getting as much blood flow as they should when you are sweating all of this out. That could lead damage to the kidneys and actually lead ultimately to more fluid retention. Hoping to find something that gave a little bit more precision to how much a person could endure a sauna, I learned that this is part of traditional Persian medicine but I couldn't find anything that made me confident that I could recommend that you would safely go into a hot sauna. If you were to venture and try this, I would do it in a dry sauna so that you could have the evaporative cooling that is supposed to occur when you sweat. In a hot, humid environment, you won't successfully cool off. Ultimately though, I think it's important that you just try to restrict the sodium in your diet, and if you have to have a paracentesis from time to time, that's fine, and diuretics to help your kidneys release excess salt and water is going to be the safest route overall because it's in a controlled fashion. 
Another popular question that I get both when I'm doing an endoscopy and here on our channel was about the best way to resume your diet. One person noted that their wife ate a bunch of pancakes and syrup and never really seemed to restore normal gut habits. This is a fascinating question and one that has also intrigued many academic groups and so it's well researched. And what has been discovered in short is that yes, you greatly reduce the number of bacteria and the variety of bacteria when you have a bowel purge. And that is true whether it occurs because of a bowel prep for a colonoscopy or because of a diarrheal illness. The reason is much more complicated that you have simply washed out all the bacteria. It's because we've also excluded the food that is not only our food, but your bacteria's food as well. We've introduced a great amount of oxygen when there's been a rapid transit through our GI tract. There's certain bacteria that just simply can't live in an oxygen rich environment and they typically live in the oxygen poor colon, but other types are able to make use of that oxygen. And so when it's introduced, they proliferate and they come to dominate your colon and exclude those other species. An additional environmental change in your colon is that the acid base balance changes and that may be because of the clearance of short chain fatty acids that usually make the pH relatively low within the colon. Again, this changes the environment. It's sort of like climate change in the colon. It alters the species that live in the environment of your colon. These effects are so profound that the usual fingerprint that is unique to your GI bacteria is lost, whether it be because of bowel prep or a diarrheal illness. And yet what's amazing is that your bacteria are resilient. And after two to four weeks, that typical fingerprint characteristic of your GI flora has returned. So ultimately, some comfort food after your colonoscopy is well-deserved, but I would encourage you to go back to healthy eating, rich in fiber, fruit, and vegetables, and avoidance of too much in the way of heavy fat foods. And I think that you'll see the normal restoration of your colon bacteria in short order. Thank you for these interesting questions. I hope you found the answers equally interesting. Please subscribe and continue to watch and comment so we can have future videos to cover more of your top GI questions.